Okay, thank you, Professor Arauzo. Good morning, everyone. Let's start uh, now with the first presentation of this workshop. And let me introduce Professor Richard Toll. Uh, uh, I must say that it's a pleasure to have Professor Richard Toll as keynote speaker of this workshop. Uh, Dr. Richard Toll is Professor of Economic at the University of Sussex. He is also Professor of Economics of Climate Change at the Bridge University of Amsterdam. And he is also a member of the Academia Europaea. It is impossible to describe in just a few minutes the CV of Professor Toll. So what is clear is that I'm not uh, going to do a good job in introducing him, but I will try to just to summarize the most important outputs of his uh, academic profile. Uh, among the outputs of Professor Toll, uh, he has around or more than 200 papers in the Journal of Citation Reports list. Most of them are uh, papers with high impact factor. He also has around 20 software components. He is editor-in-chief of uh, Energy Economics, associate editor of Environmental and, Research and, and Resource Economics. And the REPEC database, Professor Toll ranks among the top 5% of the economists in the world. His uh, contributions to energy economics and environmental economics, especially to climate change, uh, have a great impact uh, in the academia, but also in the international forums. Uh, just a remark about his first publication about climate change that was published in 1994, so 26 years ago. And uh, uh, this shows the, um, the novel contributions of, of Professor Toll. On a personal level, I must say that it's a great pleasure for me to uh, have his participation today because nine years ago, nine or ten, he gave me the opportunity to have a research state at the Economic and Social Research Institute of Dublin, where he was uh, occupying a place of, uh, of professor in, in that time. And uh, during all this time, every uh, demand I have made to Professor Toll, um, such as uh, recommendation letters, such as participation in uh, thesis committees, everything I have asked him, he, uh, I have always had a positive answer from him. So for all these reasons, let me thank Professor Toll for dedicating his time and for uh, taking part of this workshop. Thank you, Richard, and uh, whenever you want, you can start. Okay. Um, that required a number of clicks. Okay, now. <laughs> it's uh, an uh, honor and pleasure to be here uh, in the brand new world of doing things online in a new environment, right? Um, that is constantly tripping us up. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, weather, climate, uh, and the economy. And uh, no surprise to those who know my research interests, uh, this has been um, at close to my heart for uh, a long time now. Um, I'm going to start by saying that climate matters, and climate matters to the economy. Um, this seems a trivial remark um, because if climate would not matter, then why would we care about climate change? And obviously, a lot of people do. Um, but I'm going to make clear why I need to say this. When I say that climate matters, uh, I'm not saying that climate uh, is predominant. What I'm saying is not the same as climate determinism. Climate determinism, of course, has a very long history. Uh, the first recorded instance uh, of climate determinism goes back to Bon Zong. That's about uh, 3,000 years ago. Um, but also throughout history, and actually until today, Gerard Diamond is the main proponent uh, at the moment of climate determinism. 
2,500 years, well, a bit less. Uh, and so those who live in a cold climate and in Europe, by which he means the part of Europe that is not Greece, uh, are full of spirit, but wanting in intelligence and skill. And therefore they retain comparative freedom, but have no political organization and are incapable of ruling over others. Uh, Aristotle was not aware of the British Empire. Um, whereas the natives of Asia are intelligent and inventive, uh, but they are wanting in spirit and therefore they are always in a state of subjection and slavery. Uh, with Asia, of course, Aristotle meant uh, the Middle East and India, and he was not aware of the Mughal Empire. Uh, but the Hellenic race, which is situated between them, is likewise intermediate in character, being high-spirited and also intelligent. And it continues free and is the best governed of any state. And if it could be formed into one state, it would be able to rule the world. So Aristotle did correctly uh, predict the empire founded by Alexander the Great. And, but the main point here is that he essentially says the political success of a people is completely determined by the climate in which they live, um, which is a peculiar argument to us because we have the benefit of hindsight, right? We know about the Mughal Empire and the British Empire, and we know about uh, the, Greece em uh, the Greek Empire. Um, so that is one uh, aspect of environmental determinism that we now think of as silly, although Garrett Diamond did not uh, get the message. Um, but the other thing is, of course, the self-serving nature of uh, environmental determinism that you often find here. And Aristotle essentially says that Greeks are the best, himself, of course, being uh, a Greek. Uh, so that, I'm not going to go there. This is not um, what I believe to be true uh, at all. But uh, I need to say that climate matters, even if it's not predominant, uh, because the mainstream uh, uh, in economics doesn't believe this at all. If you take two prominent papers by Bill Easterly and Danny Roderick, uh, published almost 20 years ago, essentially they argue, and they find empirically, that the only thing that matters to humans are other humans. Uh, and the Roderick paper is called Institutions Rule. And essentially what they argue in this paper is that if you control for institutions, uh, and if you want to explain the uh, income distribution across the world, then climate and geography just drop out of the equation. It's simply not there. There's no explanatory power whatsoever. Um, but your model and also take a more nuanced position uh, in this, but essentially their papers argue uh, or show that climate may have mattered in the past, and Akimolu, it may have mattered around the year 1500, 500 years ago, uh, but it doesn't matter anymore. Now, if this position is true, uh, and this is what you would find if you go to the mainstream uh, economics journals, um, if this position is true, then climate change is irrelevant, at least in the long run. It may matter in the sort of intermediate run when society and the economy are out of equilibrium with the prevailing climate, but it will not matter in the very long run because it's just a transitional issue. Um, and this position is at odds with um, what people in environmental economics uh, seem to argue. Um, and climate obviously matters for such things as agriculture. It matters for such things as energy demand. It matters for tourism. Uh, it matters for the health of humans and animals and it matters for labor productivity. Um, and it may be that these effects are smallest and hard to detect, but arguing from first principles, you simply cannot maintain the argument uh, that climate is not important. It simply cannot uh, be. And there's two papers out there that show that, <clears throat> yes, it is true that sort of if you compare countries, then it is hard to detect the climate signal because the institutional signal is so much stronger. This is not to say that the climate signal isn't there, it's just hard to detect. Um, but there's two papers out there by uh, Nordhaus in 2006 and Henderson and colleagues in 2018 uh, that shows that climate explains in part, not completely, 
uh, the income distribution within countries and within countries, of course, the institutional settings are roughly uh, similar. Um, the problem with uh, these studies uh, is that identification is problematic. It's very hard to pin down a causal relationship between climate and uh, the level um, of uh, affluence and wealth. Um, and the reason for that is uh, simple, that climate varies only very slowly over time. And other things that are important for economic development also vary over time and often a lot more quickly. Uh, so you have a confounding problem. Uh, the climate signal is much stronger over space, but over space, of course, all sorts of other things differ uh, as well. Uh, so it is hard to pinpoint the effect of climate. This is not to say that there is no effect of climate. It is just very hard uh, to find in the data. Um, some people have thought, well, if climate is so difficult to measure econometrically, or the effect of climate is so difficult to measure uh, econometrically, let's look at weather. Um, and there's by now a whole bunch of studies, and you see only a small selection here, that document an impact of weather and weather shocks on economic activity. Um, and these papers often claim that they have found a causal relationship. Um, and the argument goes as follows that, at least from an economic perspective, weather shocks are random. And therefore, it's a truly experimental setting or an almost experimental setting. And therefore, you can uh, claim a causal effect of weather shocks on economic activity. And the problem with this claim, not with the econometrics in these studies, um, is that by now, these weather effects have been documented for so many different economic activities, which we, of course, know influence one another, uh, that that claim of causality, I think, is dubious. Uh, but you cannot not argue that weather shocks do affect economic uh, activity. And there's also a bunch of papers out there that look at the effect of weather shocks on economic growth rather than uh, the level of economic activity. Um, and there's two strands in the literature there, um, and that distinction is uh, rather important for our discussion. Some papers, led by Melissa Dell, um, argue that poorer countries are more vulnerable to weather shocks than our uh, richer countries, uh, whereas there's also a strand in the literature uh, led by Marshall Burke, who argue that it's hotter countries that are more vulnerable to weather shocks than are colder countries. Um, now, in the past and in the sample and the observations that we have, this distinction is very difficult to make because most poor countries are also hot. Uh, so the difference between hot and poor in the past is actually uh, small. Um, but in the future, it makes a big difference because the projections for the rest of this century is that the world will be warmer but also much richer. Uh, and if Dell is right, that means that vulnerability because of uh, the reduction in poverty, uh, the vulnerability to climate change will fall over time. Whereas if Burke is right, actually vulnerability to weather shocks will grow as the world grows uh, warmer. So even though in sample it's hard to distinguish between the two out of sample, uh, these two different models go completely different. Uh, ways. <clears throat> um, the, one of the issues with um, looking at weather shocks to study the effect of climate change, and it's not just that, that people in this literature that I just referred to make claims about causality that are dubious, uh, they also make a claim that their study of the weather and its effect on the economy is informative about climate and climate change. Um, that is problematic too. Um, and the reason for that is the relationship uh, with uh, adaptation. So you ask the meteorologist, they would joke that climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. And formally, uh, there's two definitions of climate. One is that it's 30-year average weather. 
um, but uh, more, more appropriately, it's actually the distribution of weather outcomes that is what is uh, climate. Um, so climate is what you expect and weather is the realization. Um, and that implies that weather shocks are, by definition, almost unexpected. At best, we can forecast the weather five days in advance, but not more than that. Um, and that means that a weather shock is essentially unexpected and there's not much you can do against it. So the response to weather shocks is limited. You can put up your umbrella when it rains, you can close the floodgates when it pours. Um, but adaptation to climate is much more extensive. You can adjust your capital stock. You can buy an umbrella or you can build uh, those floodgates to protect you uh, when uh, uh, the rain pours. Um, <clears throat> and, or in other words, if you estimate the impact of weather on economic activity, you estimate the short run elasticity. Uh, whereas really, if you're into climate change and want to know the effect of climate change, you need to know the long term uh, elasticity, where the difference is adjustment in capital stock. Um, and for that reason, you cannot just interpret the effect of weather shocks on the economy as if they were would be the same as if climate uh, were to change. Uh, there's two papers out there that formally show this relationship. Um, the the Yugina paper essentially shows that through the envelope theorem uh, that if you have an economy that is perfect in the sort of standard micro uh, sense of the world uh, of the word that is people are rational well informed uh, um, everything is div infinitely divisible right so there's no lumpiness uh, in your adjustment uh, there's no public good there's no externalities under those conditions through the envelope theorem you can actually say well weather shocks are informative um, Lemoyne, so, so those are all the standard assumptions about the perfect competition in aesthetic sense. Derek Lemoyne uh, has a paper showing, well, actually, that is not quite true uh, because you also need to be in a dynamic uh, equilibrium because a lot of the things that matter uh, have to do with the capital stock and therefore our expectations of future weather. Um, and you also need to be in a dynamic uh, equilibrium. That is, it's not just that you need to be well informed about the current world, but you also need to be well informed about the present, uh, about the future world. Uh, so this is an arrow, uh, the bro type of general uh, equilibrium um, conditions that you need to meet. Um, so I think that these two papers show that it's actually not informative, that weather shocks are simply not informative because as soon as one of these conditions break, um, then um, weather is no longer informative. Weather shocks are no longer informative about climate uh, change. Um, and going back to the Lemoyne paper, he argues that your expectations should be uh, rational. There's been now a fair amount of empirical evidence that people have very peculiar ideas about how the weather works. Um, one example is a brilliant paper that shows that when the sun shines, people buy more open top cars. <clears throat> it's a very silly thing to do, right? Because if you buy an open top car, it doesn't matter the weather on the day that you make the decision to buy the car. Uh, what matters is your expectation of future um, sunny days, not whether it's sunny today or not. And another example very well documented in tourism literature is the uh, phenomenon of backyard snow, that a lot of people drive to the mountains to go skiing when it's snowing at their house. Of course, if you want to go skiing, what matters is that there's snow in the mountains, not that there's snow in your backyard, uh, but nonetheless, a lot of people uh, get in their car and drive to the mountains when it's snowing at the place that they live, um, which immediately tells you that people have very peculiar, irrational ideas about the weather, uh, both uh, tempor temporarily and spatially. Um, 
the weather is not informative about climate change. And so what are we going to do in this particular paper? Um, what uh, I'm going to show is a simultaneous model of the impact of climate and weather on economic activity. Um, and the thinking is something uh, as follows, conceptually it's fairly straightforward uh, uh, idea, um, that climate impacts the production potential of an economy. Uh, and one example is if you want to produce milk, uh, what you need is a Holsteiner cow, uh, because they're simply the best uh, at making milk. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, Holsteiners are very happy in the climate of northern Germany and southern Denmark. That's where they're from. Um, if you put a Holsteiner in a place like Thailand, it will be in trouble, will not produce a lot of milk. If you take it to such a hot place, you need to air condition uh, or water spray the cow just to keep it cool and keep it alive, and it won't produce a lot of milk. Um, on the other hand, in Thailand, uh, it's a brilliant place to grow jasmine rice, which some people say is the nicest rice in the world. Um, it's a brilliant place uh, to grow that sort of stuff, but in Denmark, you do not want to grow rice. It simply uh, will not do very well. So climate affects the potential, what you can do with your economy, not just the agricultural part of your economy, but also other bits of the economy. Um, weather shocks are lost potential. If you have a drought, uh, your crop may fail. That does not mean that it was a bad idea to grow that crop in the first place. It's just bad luck in that particular year. And if uh, next year the drought is gone, the crops will grow just as fine as they always did. So that is a drop away from your production possibility. Now, similarly, if there's a flood, it may disrupt the transport. Uh, it may stop production uh, for a bit, but that is a temporary shock. It does not affect what you could do in a particular place um, when the water has receded. Um, so that suggests that climate belongs in the production frontier of an economy, um, and weather is a source of inefficiency in the sense that you do not meet your potential uh, output. Uh, <clears throat> and then that immediately leads to something like uh, stochastic frontier analysis. Um, so we're gonna do this um, uh, to try and explain output per worker uh, for a sample of 160 countries. And our sample starts in 1915 and in 2014, uh, obviously. Some of the countries that we're looking at did not exist in 1950, and other countries existed but did not collect um, uh, data. It's an unbalanced panel. And in the frontier, we're going to put capital per worker, obviously, is one of the main ex explanatory variables uh, for output per worker. And then we're going to put in climate, that is the first year average temperature and rainfall. And then in the inefficiency term, we're going to include the anomalies, the deviation of the actual temperature and the actual rainfall from a long term uh, mean. Then we're going to uh, normalize that. <clears throat> the analysis is uh, the, the estimation technique is stochastic frontier analysis. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this, um, and essentially goes back to pretty basic micro, there's three tenets of uh, uh, a uh, three tenets of efficiency, and one of the tenets is uh, production efficiency. That is, a company cannot rearrange its outputs, the same amount of outputs, but just rearrange to make more. Sorry, a company cannot rearrange its inputs to make more outputs. That is one of the things that we talk about in Micro uh, 101 with uh, our students. And that defines your production frontier. That is your production uh, possibility. Um, there's two issues with this if you take it to the data. One is that this is imperfectly observed. Um, so there's this noise in our measurements, uh, idios idiosyncrasies uh, in the companies that we look at. Uh, but also when you do that, when you take it to the data, you realize that it doesn't quite fit, that you can't quite find the production frontier. Uh, and there seems to be inframarginal companies out there and the, the, that, according to microeconomic theory, should have gone bankrupt. But of course, we don't ever observe the economy in an equilibrium. 
and there's always has been some shock and the economy is always out of equilibrium. We believe our macro is always moving towards an equilibrium. Um, but we observe our economy out of equilibrium and that means that you also find companies that are not efficient in the production sense of the word. Um, and then the story is that those companies either would go bankrupt after we stop looking at them, and because we only take a snapshot of the economy, or they would rearrange and reorganize or perhaps merge with more efficient companies and up their game. That is sort of the thinking behind it. Now that in efficiency term, that's essentially which companies are away from uh, the frontier, um, is represented as an inefficiency term, which is technically modeled as a one-sided error term. Um, now, it looks something as follows. We're going to use the uh, true fixed effect uh, model developed by Bill Green and published in 2005. Uh, this is essentially uh, a panel data, in our case, an unbalanced panel. Um, in the frontier, uh, on the left-hand side, we're going to put output per worker. In country I, it's time T. On the right hand side, we have per capita capital uh, and the 30 year average temperature, and it's square. Same for precipitation. So, this is IT, so this moves very slowly over time. So, in 1950, we have the temperature average from 1920 to 1949, and then in 1951, we have it from 1921 to 1950. Uh, so that is how these variables are defined. Um, we have a shared time trend. I'll go back uh, to that later. Um, we have country dummies. Then we have the idiosyncratic error, which is just symmetric and uh, IID. And we have the inefficiency term U. The inefficiency term U is a half normal. That's the plus here. It's not a normal distribution with a zero location parameter and a, a scale parameter sigma squared. And that sigma squared uh, is a function of, it's essentially country specific. This is a country specific intercept or a country dummy, if you will. And then we add to that temperature in deviation from a long-term mean scaled by the standard deviation of temperature. So this is essentially your standard standardized temperature and ditto for rainfall. And then we take the absolute value uh, of that. Now, because this is a half normal, and even though its location parameter is zero, that does not mean that its expectation is zero. Its expectation is actually uh, sigma times uh, the square root of two over pi. Um, so that is uh, the model that we're gonna estimate. Now, it is obviously highly nonlinear. This is a fairly cumbersome model uh, to estimate. Um, you've never done that. If you're inspired by what I'm saying and you say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to use Stata for that, don't follow Stata. Stata is going to lead you to SF Cross and SF Panel. Uh, but really, you want to use SF Model uh, for this because the sort of preferred um, uh, the preferred methods in SATA um, are just not any good. Um, in the standard run, we're going to use the exponential. Uh, we're going to use the half normal uh, for the for the uh, inefficiency term. We're also going to try the exponential as robustness. Uh, in the standard model, we have the absolute uh, anomalies. We're also going to try linear anomalies, and asymmetric anomalies, and squared anomalies, um, and Going back to the discussion uh, between Dell and Berg, we're also going to introduce heterogeneity and in income versus climate. <coughs> Key concern uh, in all this, and I'm going to come back to that at some length, is non stationarity. Um, now, what do we find when we estimate this model? I'll get to the interpretation uh, in a minute. Capital is highly significant, no uh, surprise there. Uh, temperature pops up as uh, significant, uh, but also the interaction of temperature and a poverty dummy um, pops up significant. So the response is different in rich and poor countries. Rainfall doesn't do anything for the frontier. This is what other country studies uh, have found as well. The reason is probably that rainfall isn't just 
just isn't properly defined when you look at a country as a whole. It's much more regional than that. Um, rain does pop up. So this is not, this is the rainy weather rather than the rainy climate. And uh, does pop up in the inefficiency term. Um, and temperature uh, also pops up, but only for uh, poor countries. So what did we find? Um, in um, <coughs> the frontier, essentially what the numbers that I just showed you um, tell you is that there is a, par a parabolic relationship with a temperature and temperature squared um, between um, the output per worker uh, and the long-term average temperature. Um, if you're in a rich country, this is a fairly shallow parabola. That is, it's fine if you're in the mean, but it's not so bad if you, if, it's fine if you're in the optimum, uh, but it's not so bad if you're far away from the optimum. Whereas in poor countries, um, actually you're doing reasonably well, uh, if you're near the optimum, but you're actually doing quite badly if you're far, far away from uh, that optimum. Um, so the effect of weather, of, sorry, the effect of climate uh, is much stronger in poor countries than in rich countries. And this has to do with such things as uh, the structure uh, of the economy. There's much more activity in poorer countries in economic activity in agriculture. And therefore, you're directly exposed to the uh, weather and climate, uh, but also a lot of the things that help shield us against the effect of weather and climate, uh, such as irrigation, such as dikes, such as um, healthcare, are simply less well developed in poorer countries. They don't have the resources to pay for the necessary uh, interventions. And secondly, because a lot of these things are public goods. Uh, and their, their governance is simply not as uh, strong. Um, this effect that I show you uh, here is pretty robust to the specification. Here we look at the uh, linear uh, temperature effect and the square temperature effect and then the implied uh, optimum. And then what you see is that it just doesn't matter what we do with whether we um, omit the interactions or just the interactions in the inefficiency, whether we include uh, an additional interaction with heat, whether we switch to the exponential inefficiency, whether we exclude rain, whether we use squared anomalies or linear anomalies or asymmetric anomalies, it all doesn't really matter. Uh, the only thing that matters, and that is no surprise, is if we change our definition of what is poor, what is a poor country. Um, and in the base specification, you are poor if you're below the sample median. Um, and here we switch to uh, you're poor if the World Bank says you're poor. Um, and that makes a difference. No surprise here, because essentially we shift some of our observations from the red curve to the green curve. So there it does matter. Um, but that is not something uh, I think to worry about. Uh, so this result uh, is fine. Now, um, a problem that we have here is that we have this simple uh, dichotomy rich poor and then you need to jump if you're just above the threshold. Uh, so we tried um, a continuous interaction with capital per worker uh, instead of a property dummy. So a continuous interaction, same qualitative result. Um, the in my introduction, I talked about the mainstream economic literature and that it's all about institutions. Um, and we would have loved to test this, but the problem is that our sample starts in 1950 and indicators for institutional quality typically start around 2005. And some of them start much later, the better ones start much later. So that's just no help to us. Um, what people have found is that um, democracy is a good predictor of institutional quality. And the good thing about indicators of the formal governance of a country, whether it's democratic or autocratic, um, go back much longer uh, than 1950. It actually starts in 1800 or so. Uh, so we tried 
things with uh, policy four, which essentially tells you if your country is democratic or it's autocratic or somewhere in between, and then it's called a monocracy. Um, you know, we did that, it doesn't do much, doesn't change our results at all. We then also interacted uh, our temperature variables with the dummy for are you in a democratic country or are you in an autocratic country or are you in an anocratic country, somewhere in between. And you see that doesn't make, uh, doesn't do much. These differences are actually statistically significant, but economically, uh, they're not. Uh, so, so much for the frontier. Um, in uh, the inefficiency term, um, the um, weather shocks are bad if you're in, or temperature shocks are bad if you're in a poor country, but if it's unexpectedly cold or unexpectedly hot, your economy doesn't do so well. Similarly, if it's unexpectedly wet or unexpectedly dry, uh, you don't do so well. Uh, and then we have this negative term uh, that I'll talk about later. Uh, in the base. Um, we then tested it against a heat property, just a simple horse race, which of the two explains the data better. And uh, what we can see is that this heat just doesn't work. So it's poverty that drives vulnerability rather than uh, the climate uh, that drives uh, the vulnerability. Um, now, about the interpretation of these numbers, we're talking about inefficiency. So a positive number increases inefficiency and is therefore bad. And a negative number is therefore good. And I always have difficulty just saying uh, these sentences. Um, this number here is therefore a problem. Uh, it's hard to uh, interpret. Um, in poorer countries, because uh, 0.27 is greater than 0.09, uh, it's still a negative effect, right? Uh, unexpectedly wet or dry conditions is bad for your economy. In rich economies, therefore by implications, unexpected dry, uh, unexpectedly dry or wet conditions are good for the economy. And, and that is a peculiar result that is puzzling. Um, it may be that what we're picking up here is a broken window policy that in richer countries when there's a flood there's a lot of damage and the damage to infrastructure is not measured in uh, gdp um, whereas all the insurance payouts and all the reconstruction work is measured uh, in gdp and that may explain why we pick this up in uh, rich countries and of course in poor countries those insurance mechanisms and those reconstruction mechanisms come delayed or not at all. Uh, and that may explain uh, this particular effect. Uh, we cannot test this because we do not have an equivalent panel with MDP, uh, net domestic product data. Um, it may also be that in times of drought, uh, because of its impact on agriculture and uh, the prices of food, it is actually an effect that runs through uh, a mismeasurement of inflation. Uh, but it is a worrisome uh, result. It's hard to uh, explain. At the same time, the effect that we find in poor countries that temperature and rainfall shocks are bad, that is exactly as we would have expected. Uh, our main concern, uh, however, is non-stationarity. Uh, because the dependent variable, output per worker, and the variables of interest, temperature and rainfall, are non-stationary. Um, at the same time, both are error terms, both the idiosyncratic error term and the error term that measures inefficiency are assumed to be stationary. Um, unfortunately, at the time of speaking, as far as we know, uh, there are no tests for co-integration for stochastic frontier models, uh, let alone uh, tests for co-integration for panel uh, frontier models let alone um, test of co-integration for unbalanced panels. Um, at the same time, so we're a bit in the dark, um, at the same time, these models are very hard to estimate, as I said, uh, and therefore we estimated a very simple model. That is not because we thought the simple model was adequate, 
but because we simply were not able uh, to estimate a more complicated model. And particularly uh, worrisome is this specification here. <coughs> where we have a shared time trend in the economy. Uh, so essentially we assume that all countries grow at the same pace. All economies grow equally fast. Now a sample starts in 1950 and ends in 2014. Essentially we assume that all countries grow at the same rate. Now in the first half of our sample, Japan grew very fast and China was stagnant. And then after 1980 or so, Japan was stagnant and China grew very fast. But we assume that they grew at an equal pace, and not only throughout the period, but also at an equal pace uh, to one another. So it should not surprise you that we fail the co-integration test. I just told you there are no co-integration tests, but we just uh, close our eyes and said we're going to run co-integration tests as if these were normal errors. Um, we spectacularly failed the co-integration test. And I'm not going to show all the results uh, of that because it is a spectacular failure. Um, what here, um, I think these are slightly mislabeled. Uh, this is the residual efforts across countries uh, in red. And uh, you immediately see that this is now stationary, right? Um, and then this is the inefficiency. I think this is the uh, inefficiency um, as measured, again, efforts across countries. And you immediately, if you have any, um, any experience with co-integration tests, or in this case, stationarity tests, uh, you immediately see, well, <laughs> a standard stationarity test is rejected. Now, panel stationarity tests do not the null hypothesis is not that the efforts across countries is stationary, but every the residuals for every country need to be stationary. Uh, so if this is what the average does, you can imagine what is going on with uh, the residuals per country. It is simply never going to work. <clears throat> um, so we uh, have two remedies here, and I apologize for uh, the gray here. We did two things. One, we recast the model as error correction, and I am going to show results of that, uh, despite the suggestion here. Um, and, and then we have all uh, tools uh, at our disposal for testing and so on and so forth, and we can make the model more complicated. Um, the other thing that we did was we split the sample We split the sample and we estimated it for each decade separately and then concerns about non-stationarity are just gone by definition. We re-estimated the model by decade and then we shrunk the parameters to the sample uh, and compared it to the whole sample and compared it to when we estimate the model on the sample as a whole. Uh, and the thinking behind this is if non-stationarity had affected our parameter estimates, then they would be different in the split sample shrinkage procedure than in the estimated model on the whole sample. Um, and good thing is that they are not. Uh, so these are, sorry, um, these are numbers you've seen before, uh, and this is when you split the sample and then shrink the parameters. Um, <clears throat> in green, there's no statistically significant difference between uh, the numbers. So it's mostly green, so that is good. Uh, we find a statistically significant difference between uh, capital, uh, the effect of capital uh, per worker. It's statistically different, but not economically. It's 0 0.62 versus 0 0.59, and this is not a parameter of interest anyway. We also find that a previously insignificant parameter but positive uh, became weakly significant but negative. And the difference between these two is statistically significant, but who cares about statistical, statistically significant differences between parameters that are not statistically significant. Um, in the inefficiency, uh, we do find that the effect of rainfall, unexpected rainfall on poor countries has gone bigger. Um, 
but that does not change our qualitative story. Uh, so this is reassuring. Uh, then we estimated, re-estimated the model as an error correction, uh, same specification. Um, same specification in the frontier. So the frontier has now become the long run uh, equilibrium. And then in the deviation, essentially what we said, well, there's a <clears throat> movement back towards the equilibrium and the speed of that movement is measured by the parameter lambda one. Um, and then we said, well, actually getting out of equilibrium is a function of weather. So essentially we kick the economies away from their potential uh, economy. Uh, if the weather is a nominally hot or cold or a nominally wet or dry. <clears throat> the estimate this model, we find statively the same result. Um, there's still a parabolic relationship with temperature and stronger uh, in poorer countries. Um, too much water is actually now bad for rich countries, too little for poor countries. It does uh, show up, um, rainfall now uh, shows up uh, <clears throat> in um, the uh, equilibrium, not in the frontier. Um, so that is an interesting uh, deviation, doesn't change our story, um, really. Um, in the short run, uh, rainfall shocks reduce growth in poor countries, which is what we had previously. Uh, and the puzzling effect of the positive effect uh, of rainfall shocks on rich countries now disappear. So actually our story becomes more intuitive. Um, uh, it doesn't change much, but there's a wrinkle uh, that disappears. So this sort of satisfies us that it's not, it's not a spurious relationship uh, that we found before. Um, so to start wrapping up, what we find is a climate effect the production potential of uh, economies um, and that weather affects economic activity. Uh, and both of these effects are stronger in poor countries. Um, the implication is that a shelling conjecture holds. That is, if you're worried about the impact of climate change, there are two things you can do, not just one. One, you can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and have less climate change. Uh, but second, growing rich actually helps you reduce your vulnerability uh, to climate change. Um, and that is what our uh, results suggest. Uh, there's also methodological implications for basically all the literature that has gone on before. Um, the, those studies that have regressed income or some other indicator of economic uh, wealth on climate should have accounted for weather-induced heteroscedasticity. Um, and because weather-induced heteroscedasticity is correlated with climate, um, if they have used them definitely, if you sort of take a short panel or even a cross-section, as many of these studies have done, there is a good chance that their parameters are biased. Those studies that have regressed growth on weather should have accounted for land variables, because in our specification, if our specification is correct, which it was not for me to judge, but for you to judge, yeah, but if our specification is correct, then the effect of a weather shock is that you are moved away from your production potential. But the year after, when, your, when the weather shock is gone, when the weather has returned to normal and uh, there's normal rainfall again and uh, reasonable temperatures, then your economy bounces back to its potential. Uh, and that is measured in economic growth as extra rapid uh, growth. Um, so these studies should have included lagged effects, and in fact, they should have uh, imposed if our specification is correct, should have imposed uh, restrictions on the sum of the um, immediate effect and the lag effect, and they haven't done so. Um, so essentially, if our model is true, if our specification is correct, and basically all the studies that have come before are wrong. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Richard, for your interesting presentation. Uh, we have 
a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, anybody has questions? Yes, yeah. Let's see if you can, can you hear me? Yes. yes you can. Hi, Richard. I, I also thought, like Maria, it was a very interesting presentation. Um, I was just wondering um, if there would be a way to kind of test your, I, I, if I understand correctly, you want to, you say that climate affects um, the left-hand side variable, but but weather doesn't. Only it only does affect through the shocks, through fluctuations. And I wonder if there would be a way to sort of to test this 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 hypothesis. No, I mean, is there a way that you could show that actually weather does not directly affect? Um, the potential. Maybe I don't understand the framework. I'm, I'm not familiar with what you're doing, but somehow I thought this is an interesting assumption, and I, I, I would even be interested in knowing whether that would be true, you know? I, and I don't know if people have shown this or not. I, I don't know. Maybe yes. What do you think? Um, first of all, let me apologize. I only now realize that my camera was off the whole time. Uh, so I was wildly gesticulating, uh, and you missed all that. Um, <clears throat> Ariel, I'm, I'm sorry for being unclear. Um, what we do in this model uh, and in this paper is argue that climate change or climate, sorry, affects the production from tear and weather affects the distance from the frontier. Yeah, so we have both climate effects and um, weather effects simultaneously. Now, in right. the previous literature, there is documentation of climate effects, um, and there's also documentation of weather effects. And what we do in this paper is marry the two in one model. And by right. implication, and that is how I ended, uh, if this specification is true, and we find significant effects, statistically significant effects, and also economically significant effects uh, of both climate and weather, by implication, uh, everybody who's modeled the two separately did something wrong. Does that answer the question? Well, no, I am. So now I understand more uh, clearly, like the big picture of what you were doing. Um, I guess sort of my, my question was more specific in the sense that. I wonder if both weather and climate could be affect, affecting potential output rather than weather affecting only through the error term and, and so fluctuation. I mean, I, I don't know if this is something. Okay. Yes, 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 sorry for not uh, understanding the question. Um, we did try that, uh, and no surprise, it did not pop up because there there is no credible mechanism through which um, weather could affect the potential, right? There's just no conceptual relationship. So those things did not pop up significantly. Um, if you're going to put climate into the inefficiency, then you run into the problem that it changes so very slowly. Mm -hmm. um, and we have country dummies, right? So the spatial variation is taken out uh, anyway. Um, and we have a temperature trend and we have a time trend in there and climate, I mean, the climate trends are slightly different across uh, space, but not a whole lot different. Uh, that also, if you put climate in the inefficiency term, you run into horrendous problems with estimation because linearity essentially. Uh, but when we did try that, it did not pop up as significant, but that may just be because the estimation was so inefficient, right? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for, for the answer, Richard. Okay. There is a question by Juan Antonio. Um, 
Antonio? Yeah. Yeah, good morning. Uh, a, lot, a lot of thanks. In their presentation, it was so appealing. Uh, I think that they are very interesting synthesis of, of results and also uh, own results made by you. Um, I, I have only a, a, a small question is that uh, here there is an important discussion about what measure of temperature we can use in this type of models because climatology says that maybe the minimum temperature is better than use average temperature and this type of things. I, I don't know because maybe I have lost some. Antonio? Yeah, you're dropping out. I got the I got the gist of the question. Um, why did you use? At that so. Yeah. Why did you use average temperature and cumulative rainfall rather than another measure? Uh, for temperature, the answer is very simple. Um, on a country level, the annual average temperature is very closely correlated with the minimum temperature and the maximum temperature and so on and so forth. And it just doesn't, you, you just don't have statistical power to make a distinction uh, between the two and then you might still use the average. Um, that is probably less true for rainfall where these things do uh, very more. Uh, but uh, also there, total cumulative rainfall is a pretty good indicator for the rainfall regime uh, in a particular country. Um, an argument that you should really look at other aspects of rainfall, the number of dry days, for instance, or the number of rainy days it complements. Um, those arguments work well if you're interested in, say, growing wheat. Uh, then you can make a specific argument for a specific rainfall indicator. Um, but if you look at it across agriculture, let alone across uh, the economy, uh, then for different sectors of the economy, you would have used a different rainfall indicator anyway. Uh, and as they're all reasonably correlated, if you look at the economy as a whole, you might as well take uh, cumulative rainfall over the year. Um, but um, and, and I mean, there's, there's a number of studies out there that look at these things in detail and sort of try every possible permutation of every possible uh, rainfall and temperature uh, indicator. And what these studies find is that, yeah, it matters a little bit quantitatively, but it doesn't matter qualitatively. Uh, so that's why uh, we did not do this and definitely did not show this in this particular paper because it's I think it just takes up time um, without generating uh, any new insight. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the answer. Okay. Are any other question? I have a, a, a final uh, question, and it's about the environmental policy. The use of uh, of weather and climate impacts. Uh, do you think that these uh, have some implications in terms of the traditional environmental uh, instruments, or do you think that uh, uh, there is uh, a need of combine industrial policy with environmental policy, or this is something that uh, is not. Uh, of course, it's not in the in the objective of of the paper, but uh, we we should think in a change in the traditional instruments used to find against climate change. Uh, that that is a <clears throat> difficult question. Um, yeah, and you're rightly uh, say it's not in the paper at all. Uh, but yeah, you know me a bit longer, so you know that I've also worked on those issues. Um, I mean, there's two answers there, right? One is that as uh, we should advocate for first best 
climate policy or environmental policy or any policy for that matter. That is our job as analysts uh, to try and move actual policy closer to the ideal. Uh, and therefore, we should never stop advocating for first best policy intervention, right? Um, at the same time, we should not be blind to the reality that politicians work in a different field uh, altogether, need to balance all uh, interests, and that sometimes a crummy first best policy intervention only thing that is possible and if it moves us closer to the ideal then we should just stop up stop our whining and say okay this is better than nothing right uh, so, so so that is one answer um the second answer of course the first best policy intervention in um perfect economy that is perfect except for one externality, uh, say greenhouse gas emissions, is a PBU tax, a uh, uniform uh, tax uh, that is applied without exemption, right? That is what we know is best if your economy starts up in, uh, uh, in an efficient but for one uh, problem. Um, but that is also not true, right? That actually there's market power uh, and so on and so forth. So there's other uh, uh, there's other externalities that environmental externalities interact with. Uh, there's public goods and so on and so forth. Um, and and there's also of course issues where the carbon tax just cannot reach, right? Um, and for those reasons, we should deviate from a simple solution right because a simple solution works if you have a simple problem but you don't have a simple problem and there i think we should just be uh, judicious uh, i still think that even if there is market power in the economy and strictly uh, you would not want to use a uniform carbon tax but you want to differentiate your carbon tax uh, then having a uniform carbon tax is probably cheaper than letting politicians run riot and give favors to their friends when they're differentiating climate policy. Uh, so also from a sense of lobbying and regulatory capture, sometimes it is better to advocate for a simple instrument that we know is inefficient in theory than giving politicians license to differentiate policy not according to what economic theory says they should differentiate but what uh, the lobbyists tell them how they should differentiate um, but sometimes it just doesn't work and i give you two examples one is subsistence rice right there's a lot of methane coming out of uh, rice paddies and a lot of that rice is eaten by the farmer you're never going to tax that right that's just you're never going to tax that uh, because you don't know how much they're growing in the first place and you essentially what you say well it's, it's a private transaction within a household right are you going to tax the farmer uh, to eat his own rice no that's completely uh, impractical right uh, so there really you should go for subsidies and technological inter interventions and just making methane, low methane uh, rice more attractive to them and that's technological intervention um, and another uh, example and this actually comes out of china um, at the moment solar power is cheaper than coal power in most of china yet the chinese are continuing to build coal-fired power plants and the reason for that is that the coal companies are very close to the government and the solar companies are much more distant from the government and it's essentially regulatory capture and then you can apply uh, a carbon tax till the cows come home and you can increase the carbon tax as much as you want that is not going to change this the problem is not that coal is too cheap the problem is that coal is too powerful 
So there the answer is not apply a carbon tax, but the answer is yeah, get your regular uh, get your regulators in check and allow for insight and oversight. Uh, over how decisions by the electricity authorities are made and whether they are made uh, without uh, favor to particular fuels. Um, so then the answer to get China away from coal and onto solar is not a carbon tax, but is regulatory reform. Uh, and I think we should realize that, yeah, that is the case in some countries in some situations. 